Well, into this scenario of a fight between who's going to win out, Buddhist or Hindu, into this scenario step the Muslims coming in from the West. The Muslims arrived in waves with the first wave hitting maybe about the year 800, but finally they came in a big wave around the year 1000, and they wound up conquering all of what is northern India. The places they conquered, they're still there. Today they're known as Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, northern, the more, northern part of India, the mountainous region. Islam was not able to penetrate very deeply into the main body of the peninsula of India. And again, folks, you can wonder why, and part of it might be that this region of India has fewer trees, um, more of the type of land that the Arabs are capable of fighting in. Now, the Arabs, in fact, did have one big advantage. I'm going to call them, I call them Arabs, I call them Islamic, I call them Muslims, different words for the same thing. One reason is the Muslims came in riding on horseback with mounted cavalry. The people of India, the soldiers, oftentimes rode elephants. And it was finally discovered that the horse was a better fighting animal than an elephant. The elephant, for one thing, you're too high off the ground. I've often wondered what it would be like to fight on the back of an elephant. I mean, you know, you're so high up, and you know if you fall, you're going to die. At least from a horseback, a lot of people who fall from horses survive. But you're just too high up, and you cannot get your legs around the elephant's body. You can around a horse. So um, the, the, the horse, much faster than the elephant, and speed is important in battle. If you're faster than the enemy, that means you can decide whether to get battle or not. If you don't want to get battle, all you have to do is get out, run. But if you're slower than your enemy, he decides whether or not to get battle. And that gives him the advantage. And uh, when, if he's winning, he'll just stay, keep on fighting, and you can't outrun him. If he's losing, I mean, if the enemy is faster than you and he's losing, all he has to do is turn and run and come back another day. Uh, eventually, the Indian armies abandoned their elephants and began to ride horseback when they saw the horses were better. But um, that may be one reason why that eventually the people of India living down here were able to stop the Islamic advance. Now, from that day till this, Hindus and Islams hate each other. Now, I spent 27 years at Lockheed, and very early in my career there, I noticed that Lockheed would hire a lot of people from this part of the world, hoping they'd buy our airplanes. And one day they hired, well, not in the same day, but they hired a man from India and a man from Pakistan. And at first, I mean, they stuck them both in our department. At first, the two men did not get along at all. But then they realized they were more alike than they, than they were like anyone else. And after a while, they became fast, hard friends. The one from India, unfortunately, did not live long. The one from Pakistan, as far as I know, he's still there. He eventually became a supervisor. But um, they hated each other, and it had several reasons. Uh, of course, I talked to a man from India who sat in one of my classes a few years back, and he insists that the Indian people were forced, converted to Islam at sort of point. I looked it up and did research, and what I found is that in some cases this apparently is true, in other cases it was not. You cannot say, I mean, it depends on the ruler and time zone. You cannot make one blanket statement. Yes, apparently, apparently, some Hindu people were converted to Islam at sword point. There are other differences they have. Muslims eat beef. Hindus do not. Hindus consider the cow to be their most sacred animal, and they refuse to eat it. And uh, therefore, they hate each other over that issue. Neither one of them eats pork. But beef, yes, the Muslims do, the Hindus do not. There are other reasons, um, particularly in regard to women. Um, both sides, to me, had problems with their women, but your book winds up saying that when all was said and done, a lot of times Muslim women had more freedom than Hindu women. 
at least Muslim women could inherit property and could own property or could inherit and state and own property. Hindu women could not do either. Hindu women were still forced to throw themselves on a fire when their husbands died, uh, something the Muslims did not try to get the Hindus to stop. But also, Muslims believe that women, the woman's body should be completely covered, in some cases even her hands and face. Hindu art oftentimes depicted completely nude women as a form of art expression, which the Muslims considered vulgar. Um, so uh, this, this created some kind of a conflict between the two. Your book spent some time comparing and contrasting them. Um, in the issue of kingship, the, some of the Hindus believed that the king was divine, and some Muslims, even though Mohammed definitely did not teach that the king was divine, but some Muslims say, hey, this is a great idea. I think I'll declare that I'm divine also. And um, the result was um, a lot of Muslims then began to copy the uh, Hindu type of leadership. The two sides borrowed from each other a little bit, but the fact is they could not intermix, they could not mingle, could not what you call assimilate, um, owing to the fact that each side was too steeped in their own tradition. The fight continues to this day. Both sides, particularly India and Pakistan, both sides developed the atomic bomb and uh, the Hindus continually accused the Pakistanis of terrorism, practicing terroristic activities. And as for the United States, we try to get along with both sides, and it's very difficult to do because the two sides' hatred of each other runs back for thousands of years, and is very deep. Um, Now, your book goes on to talk more about uh, some of the empires, and again, don't worry about each of the empires and how much territory they had. If you take Indian history further, you'll get deeper into that. I'm looking at page 248 now. Uh, there's this empire and what we now would call Afghanistan and another one in what we call Pakistan. Um, another one way down to the south tip of the Indian Peninsula. Um, however, what I do want you to remember is that name Tamerlane, but we'll take that as name up next time. Um, another thing you want to remember is this word stupa. We were introduced to it when we first visited India. Essentially, when the Indian kings became Buddhist, they began to honor these places, holy places, where that Buddha had been. And um, these places were called stupas, and they began to build more expensive and more elaborate monuments at these places. As Again, you might say but it's the government got involved, and the government money got involved in building them. Um, now, one problem that Buddhism has had, and I have mentioned this, your book mentioned again, is that Buddhist sayings were not written till, down until 200 years after he died. And what happened was, maybe this community over here would say, tell the hits followers that Buddha said this, but about 10 miles away down the path, there'd be another community who had said, who would say Buddha said the opposite. They didn't have, again, didn't have telephones, and they, this one community would be following Buddha one way, and another community over here we followed Buddha another way. Now this happened among Christians and Muslims also, by the way. Uh, this was before TV stand, attempted to standardize things. And uh, the result was Buddhism eventually became confused because nobody quite knew what he said. I mean, let's face it, folk, 200 years ago, suppose we had written down nothing for the last 200 years. So 200 years ago, James Madison was president. Nobody alive today can remember anybody who is alive who remembers him, if you know what I mean. In other words, nobody has talked today talked to anyone who talked to someone who would have talked to James Madison or anyone alive at that time. Uh, human life is shorter than that. So uh, 
by the time Buddha's sayings were written down, you know, it's hard to tell exactly what he said. Whereas Mohammed, his sayings were written while he was alive, and Jesus' sayings were written by people who actually heard them. But uh, in the case of Buddha, it's a little bit more difficult.